Last week we learned about the dispensational doctrine of imminence and how many pre-tribulational dispensationalist teachers believe that the rapture could happen at any moment. But after that, we learned what scripture plainly says in regards to the return of the Lord. We saw that Jesus listed many prophetic signs that precede his second coming in Matthew 24, and our Lord made it clear that his singular return would take place after an increase in lawlessness, after the abomination of desolation in the temple in Judea, and after the great tribulation of those days. Plus, we saw that this sequence was mirrored in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 by Paul, when he explained that the coming of the Lord and our gathering together to him would not occur unless the falling away happened first and the man of sin was revealed in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. In fact, in Luke's gospel, Jesus said of his return, And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. So we clearly established that there are some prophetic events that must take place before the Lord returns in the clouds with power and great glory. And unless the stars fall from the sky and the sun and the moon go dark, then the day of the Lord, when the rapture will occur according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians, will not arrive. But we did not have time last week to address the verses that Dr. Tommy Ice said infer an imminent pre-trib rapture. And you may still be wondering why these intelligent and sincere brothers in Christ believe that there will be an imminent secret rapture before the actual second coming of Jesus Christ. So today, we'll look at the verses that our pre-tribulational brothers and sisters point to when they speak of the imminent return of Jesus. And we'll look at them very carefully in context to determine what doctrine these verses are actually teaching, if it's not the doctrine of the imminent return of the Lord. Now to begin... The most famous passages that are commonly misinterpreted to support the doctrine of an imminent pre-tribulational rapture are the scriptures where we get the phrase, a thief in the night. And one place we find the concept of a thief in the night is what we call the Olivet Discourse, when Jesus answered questions from his disciples on the Mount of Olives about when the temple would be destroyed and what the sign of his coming would be, and the end of the age. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24 contains the longest account of the Lord's answer to their questions on the Mount of Olives. And in Mark, it's chapter 13, while in Luke, it's chapter 21. Matthew records that after Jesus explained in great detail the signs of his coming, he also said, Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And Luke records this same parable in chapter 12 when he writes, But... Know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So, in both of these accounts, the parable of the thief in the night was about a thief who breaks into a home 
at an hour that the master of the house did not expect. And because the homeowner wasn't watching for the thief, and because he didn't know what hour the thief would arrive, he was not ready, and he allowed his house to be broken into. In the parable's explanation, Jesus compares the master of the house to his disciples, and the thief to himself when he comes. And most importantly, in the explanation of the parable, Jesus compared the master of the house watching for the thief to the disciples being ready. Jesus was clear that the whole point of this parable was that his disciples should be ready because he is coming in an hour they did not expect. Now in Matthew, before Jesus gave this parable, he also had said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. So how can it be true that they were to look for all of these very specific signs that will only happen once, to know when the return of the Lord was near, and yet he would come in an hour they did not expect. How can both of these passages coexist and harmonize? Well, the key is the time-related words that Jesus is using. Jesus said, When you see all these things, know that the end of the age and the return of the Lord is is near. But near doesn't give us the day or the hour. It gives us a general time period. So, up to verse 33 in Matthew 24, Jesus reveals the major signs that will guarantee that we are in the general time frame of his return. And then suddenly Jesus begins to make some very detailed statements about time as he continues. His next words were, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So after listing the most important signs that we must watch for, which will indicate that his return is very near, Jesus explains that the generation that sees all of these signs will by no means pass away till he returns and the end of the age arrives. And then Jesus uses two specific time words, day and hour, to let us know what cannot be revealed about his return. So, he revealed specific signs that tell us when the time is near. He revealed that the generation that sees all those signs will not pass away before all of this is fulfilled. And he added that we cannot know the day or the hour. Clearly, all of these words are narrowing down the time frame of his return in relation to the signs he described while explaining that there is a limit to what we can know for certain. The second, the minute, the hour, and the day are beyond our reach. But larger periods of time, such as a week or a month, are never listed as something we cannot know. And this is the context of what Jesus meant when he said, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. 
He didn't say he was coming in a month, we didn't expect, or a year. He specifically said, hour. And we can see that it is the detailed, time-related words in Matthew 24 that confuse so many Bible scholars. But Jesus was simply narrowing down the specific time frame of his return while repeatedly explaining that there is a limit to what we can know, and we must trust that if we see all of the signs he described, then we can look up because our redemption is drawing near. These times at the end of the tribulation will be the darkest and most difficult days that the world has ever faced. And through this dark time, every living follower of Jesus must endure in the faith to the end to be saved. So, even though we don't know the day or the hour, those who make it to this point in the future must hold fast to the faith and know that if they have seen the signs of his return, he is near and the great tribulation is just about to end. So, for those who are in the time period, when they have seen all of the signs, and they know that he is near but hasn't yet come, there is an aspect of imminency to the thief in the night teaching. But in this case, it is only in regards to hours, not days, months, or years. And Jesus plainly taught that his return was only imminent after the tribulation of those days, when the sun and the moon grow dark and the stars fall from the heavens. As always, keeping a passage in its original context is the key to not distorting its meaning. And that is how so many intelligent folks have misunderstood the doctrine of imminency and what Jesus was actually teaching. They have pulled the thief in the night passage out from its native context within the rest of what Jesus said instead of simply allowing the whole teaching of Jesus to stand on its own as a complete and systematic message. And this type of grasshopper exegesis, where you bounce around from passage to passage, making up rules and ripping things out of their overall context, which sadly is a characteristic of dispensationalism, is always a recipe for error. But to confirm that we have correctly understood all that Jesus was teaching here, we need to look for all of the related passages that refer back to this passage to see what they say too. For example, Peter wrote, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, Look for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. Peter explains that it is specifically the day of the Lord that will come as a thief in the night. And, we will see later that Paul says the exact same thing. But was the day of the Lord what Jesus was teaching about too? Well, Jesus said, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then... All the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So how can we know for sure 
that this is describing the day of the Lord? Simple. Because Isaiah wrote, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. And Joel also prophesied, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark, and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord will also roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So there are multiple passages in Scripture that witness that the day of the Lord is characterized by the sun and the moon going dark and the stars ceasing to shine. And that is exactly what Jesus said would happen before he returns. So, Peter and Paul understood that the return of Jesus and the day of the Lord were synonymous, and they both wrote about how the day would come as a thief in the night, because that's the parable Jesus gave them when he described that day. But Peter did not describe a secret rapture coming as a thief in the night before the Great Tribulation, Peter described a day when the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And this corresponds to the signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And Peter did not say that we should be looking forward to a secret rapture that occurs before the day of the Lord. He said we should look forward to these things in reference to the burning up of the earth and the establishment of a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. John confirms this context when he recorded, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Jesus was still coming as a thief, even as Satan, the false prophet and the Antichrist, were gathering the kings of the earth to the battle of Armageddon. This also proves that the thief in the night concept is not referring to to a pre-tribulational rapture that's just around the corner. It's referring to the day of the Lord, when the Messiah will destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. And all of this is why Paul immediately follows his description of the rapture by saying, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul knew the rapture was going to happen on the day of the Lord, which was coming like a thief. And he explained that at the same time the saints would be resurrected and gathered to the Lord in the air, sudden destruction would come upon the sinners who refused to repent. 
Paul said that the sinners shall not escape on that day. But he added that the Thessalonian disciples and all those who follow Jesus faithfully are not in spiritual darkness, that the day of the Lord would overtake them like a thief. If we're following Jesus Christ in the Spirit, we're children of the day, and we're not walking in sin and rebellion against God. So we will be gathered together to meet the Lord in the air, and we will obtain salvation through Jesus Christ on that day and be spared from the outpouring of His great wrath. So those who are Christ's at His coming will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet. But those who are walking in darkness will be destroyed on that day, and they will not be able to escape. And the real message of every passage that refers to Jesus coming like a thief is actually a message that we should be consistently walking in holiness and righteousness as we await our Lord's return. Paul reminded the Thessalonians to continue to walk in the light. Peter explained that we should live in holy conduct with godliness, without spot in blamelessness. And Jesus warned that we should keep or guard our garments. But here I should mention that there is another way to think of these concepts of imminence, and that is by breaking time into two separate categories. For example, we can think about history and things that have happened in the past, such as the Civil War, but we can't experience them personally. Or, we can speak about certain things that we have experienced in our own personal lifetime. So for each person, there is something that we can call personal time, which is all of the time within human history that each individual can experience for themselves, and there is historical time, which we all know by records and accounts, but not experientially. So even though we might say historically that we've been waiting for the return of the Lord for nearly 2,000 years, technically, we each have only experientially been waiting for His return since we were first made aware that He would be returning. And when we realize how each of our lives lays out on the timeline of history, we can understand that there are clearly signs that precede the day of the Lord, such as the falling away and the abomination of desolation. But we could all die at any given moment, and we're not guaranteed tomorrow or even later today. The only life we have for certain is the present, and we must all choose to crucify our flesh every day and live for Jesus in righteousness by the power of the Holy Spirit because we never know if our next moment will be our last. So even if the Lord does not return for another 10 or 20 years, but you die tomorrow in a state of ongoing unrepentant sin, you will not take part in the first resurrection, and you will not be gathered to Him in the clouds. This is another way that the rapture can be imminent even while there still are prophetic events that must proceed it. Scripture explains, It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So the life that you are living today is the only time you can be sure of to truly live for Jesus and offer your body as a living sacrifice. Once you breathe your last breath, the time for choosing to serve Him is over, and all that remains is the judgment. And Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And we must realize, this verse applies to everyone who has ever lived. The resurrection of life is the first resurrection. And to be part of that resurrection, and to be gathered to Jesus in the clouds when He returns, we all must repent and turn from sin to follow our Savior in faith. And then we must continue to follow Him in obedience 
by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. So in terms of the rapture and the first resurrection, only those who are alive and remain through the great tribulation will see the preceding signs. But for all those who die before those signs are complete, it will be as if the return of the Lord came without any warning. Friends, humble, consistent, and faithful obedience in love is what God has always desired. And that is the most valuable lesson you can ever learn in the Word of God. If you seek to obey Jesus in humility, faith, and love, above all else, the timing of the rapture and the day of the Lord will never really be a problem for you. But along with Paul and the Holy Spirit, I beg you to never let anyone deceive you about the coming of our Lord and our gathering together to Him, because that day cannot come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed in the temple of God.